Hey, this is Bruce with Pony Express Ministry, and this is our new teaching. It's a five-part series on tithing, and it's going to be looking at what the tithe is, what it was, what it is today, what God said about it then, what He says about it now. We're going to be looking at this from completely from a biblical standpoint. You know, we don't want to get into what Jesus said in Mark 7:7. 7, 7, that uh, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts and commandments of men. And uh, we don't want to do that. But I do want to point out that uh, just like it says in 1 Timothy 1.5, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And I truly believe, like Jesus said in John 8.32, that when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And so that's our desire, is to see people set free and walking in the freedom of Jesus Christ and living the abundant life that He came to give us. Um, I also think that when we study Scripture, we should take 2 Timothy 2.15 to heart. It says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. And you know what it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved of God. Approved of God, to me, that means that our speech, our ideas, what we teach, it lines up with what God says. His word approves what we say because it's what written and said in the Word of God. As a workman who does not need to be ashamed, you know, I think of Romans 1.16, where the Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation for the Jew and the Greek, for therein that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so, you know what? It's all about what Jesus did for us. It's all about His works, not about our works. And uh, we don't need to be ashamed of that, that we don't have to work for God's favor. We don't have to work for God's blessing. We don't have to work for eternal life. Jesus paid the price. He did it all with His blood, with His sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. And we don't need to be ashamed of that. Handling accurately the word of truth, knowing how to rightly divide the word of God. And, you know, you may have your own ideas and your own system for doing that. For me personally, I always like to ask, you know, who, what, where, when, how, and why. Uh, because it establishes, number one, who, who's talking, who is speaking, and who is being spoken to, why it's being said, where it's being said, when it's being said, and how it's being said. You'll find that God is uh, speaking to the Jew, or the Greek, or the church. And so I always keep those things in mind when I'm studying Scripture. And, uh, you know, I would urge you to, to do the same thing. But we're going to get right in here. We're going to be looking at Abraham and Melchizedek in this first part of the five-part teaching on tithing, and we're going to be getting a jump start here into this um, in Genesis 14, verses 17 through 23. I'd also like to point out that uh, it's important to note that the practice of bringing the tithes to a god. It was a common practice in many ancient cultures, Jewish and pagan alike. Um, it's also worth mentioning that tithing didn't necessarily originate in the Bible. We read about it here in Genesis 14, but this was a practice of that age, that time, and that era. It was a well-known pagan practice from Phoenicia, Egypt, Canaan, Mesopotamia, 
and all the lands around the Fertile Crescent area. Um, it was a mandatory, customary tax to a pagan god or a ruler. And according to the customs of the time, Abram, who we call Abraham, he was obligated to pay a tithe tax on the spoils of war to the local priest king, while the 90% belonged to the victor. When they had a war, that 10% tithe had to be paid to a god or a king or a priest, and the victor got to keep the 90%. But let's pick it up here in Genesis 14. Verse 17, it says, Then after his return from the defeat of Shadalamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me, and take the goods for yourself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. And so... We want to look at Melchizedek and Abraham, what was being said there, the types and the shadows of what took place. You know, God doesn't do anything for no reason. He's trying to show us something, and we're going to look at that. Melchizedek was a priest who blessed two systems in Abraham. Abraham's called the father of faith, but this was before the Old Covenant, the Law. It was before the New Covenant. And uh, Abraham, we'll see, is a representation. Those two covenants were represented in Abraham. Melchizedek blessed the Law in, or, in that he took a tithe and he blessed grace, the communion, the bread, and the wine. It says that he is a king and priest of God. In verses 18 through 20, it says that Abraham gave him a tenth of all. That is a type and shadow of tithing under the law, the old covenant. And he received bread and wine. That's a type and shadow of communion, the new covenant. Melchizedek recognized and blessed both the law and the promise, grace, represented in Abraham, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, not out of command, obligation, or law. There's no command written or recorded that God instructed or commanded or obligated Abraham to pay that tithe to Melchizedek. He did it on spoils of war. He did it actually based on the customs and the, the uh, requirements on spoils of war of that era. And so we need to keep that in consideration. Abraham's tithe was a representation also of works. Melchizedek appears and presents Abraham with bread and wine. That's a representation of the promise of Christ, the body and the blood. And Abraham responds, how? With a tithe. That's the representation of law and works. Although Abraham was justified by faith, and it was his faith that was accredited to him as righteousness, we can also see the foreshadow of the works of the law represented in Abraham. If we look in the next chapter, chapter 15, we, just, we see the story unfolding. This is right after the uh, this time with an episode of Melchizedek and the bread and the wine and the blessing. Right after that, in chapter 15, we see that God promises Abraham a son. And he promises Abraham and Sarah a son, Isaac. Isaac is a representation of grace 
Sarah is a representation of the new covenant. And Abraham responds how? With Ishmael. Ishmael's mother, Hagar, representation of the old covenant of law. Ishmael is a type and shadow of law and works. Tithing is the same today. God says to live by faith. He will meet all of our needs. And he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. How do we respond? It should be by simple faith. But instead, people are tithing from a mentality of works. Thinking they have to do something to deserve what God has promised. They have to give God a percentage of their works so God will bless them. Not be angry with them. Rebuke the devil for them. Not curse them, etc., etc. The basic human condition from the fall, when Adam got kicked out and Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, the basic human condition is that we have to do something. We have to work. Which is the basic form of pride. Melchizedek came out. He presented the grace, the body and the blood. Abraham responds with tithing, with works. Let's pretend for a moment, this is, uh, first of all, this is the only account, the only record, the written record that Abraham ever tithed. It's never written that he ever tithed again. But let's just pretend, just for a moment, that let's just say that this is an example of a regular tithe that Abraham tithed that uh, this was, let's pretend that this was something that was ongoing, something he practiced on a weekly or a yearly or a monthly basis. Suppose that Abraham tithed regularly to Melchizedek. Where did he send that tithe? Um, we got to think about that. The first temple with the adjacent storehouse was not built until 953 B.C. by King Solomon. Abraham's meeting with Melchizedek was at least 1,000 years before Solomon's temple. In Melchizedek's day, there was no temple, no storehouse, and no law commanding tithes, not other than the common pagan practice. I'm talking about commanding of tithes from God Most High. It may have been an ancient pagan custom, but it was not commanded by God. If Abraham is an example for Christians to give 10% to the church, then we got to take this thing in context. We got to take it exactly what God said it. If we think this is an example of Abraham's tithe going to the church, then it would also be an example that Christians give the other 90% to Satan or to the kingdom of Sodom. It would be just like you getting your paycheck sending your 10% to the church and you turn around and you give the other 90% back to your employer or something like now that's that just doesn't make any sense at all and you know what we got to take this thing in context we can't treat it like a buffet or a smorgasbord where we just pick out the things that we like and that sound good and then we take out and pick out the things that we don't like we've got to take what God said in its context and we've got to read it for what it is. We've got to consider the time and the customs that were in place in the world during that time. God had no temple. Solomon's temple was the first temple. It was built probably at least a thousand years after this episode took place. There's no temple of God on the earth. God is reaching out to Abraham. He's leading him to a place of promise, of abundance, and... There's a representation, there's types and shadows in what's taking place here. The spiritual aspect of this that we need to see, and that is that Melchizedek blessed both the law and the grace, the old covenant and the new covenant that was represented in Abraham. The very next series of verses in chapter 15 talks about the promised son Chapter 16 talks about Hagar, and those types and shadows are of the New Covenant grace, the bread and the wine, tithing, the works, the law, the flesh, the Old Covenant, 
However, Romans 4.13, it says Abraham is called the father of faith. However, we are not called to imitate Abraham's actions. God's promise to Abraham and, in, and his seed is that he would be heir of the world, not through law or works, but through the righteousness which is of faith.